So welcome again to the Ocean Learning Lab on Sustainable Aquaculture. Uh, we are part of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. We are, we are a global movement that empowers young leaders worldwide to build bold solutions to improve the health of the ocean. The Ocean Learning Labs are the educational component of the Ocean Leadership Program. The Ocean Leadership Program exists to build the capacity of the next generation to be these cross-disciplinary, compassionate, and dynamic systems leaders ready to drive solutions both, both locally and globally. So we now have this amazing community in which you are all a part of uh, in over 150 countries where young leaders are taking action and building these amazing companies and leading incredible projects that are addressing sustainable goal number 14. Uh, these webinars, which we call Ocean Learning Labs, are really here to help us further understand the most critical issues facing, facing the ocean and of course, uh, increase our skill sets and our capacities to act effectively on those issues. Um, today, as I had mentioned, we are talking about sustainable aquaculture, a very important and timely uh, subject. So as, as the demand for seafood has dramatically increased, technology has now made it possible to grow food in our marine waters and in the open ocean. And aquaculture is a method in which we can produce these foods and other commercial products, restore habitats, and replenish these diminished wild stocks, rebuild populations of endangered species as well. So Ron Tardif is with us. He uh, I'll let him introduce himself, but he is quite the expert on this subject. We're very lucky to have him uh, give us an overview. He'll talk about the different types of aquaculture, marine and freshwater and so on, uh, the different issues uh, in which people associate with aquaculture and how it stacks up against traditional fishing. And, and really what we hope to get out of this is to enrich everyone's understanding of the subject, but also to have a free flowing conversation, uh, less of a lecture, but more of a discourse. Uh, with that, I will introduce Ron Tardif. Ron, you have the floor. Still on mute, no. <clears throat> Hi everyone, and uh, big thanks for coming, uh, especially to those in Europe, it's pretty late. I know I'm on Greek time. Um, so yeah, today I want to talk about sustainable aquaculture. Um, myself, my experience with aquaculture dates back quite a bit, about a decade now, as I did my high school actually specializing in aquaculture. And uh, during my undergraduate, I also spent time in Norway studying aquaculture there. And um, I worked on it a bit when I was working with Environmental Defense Fund. And then most recently, I've just finished my Master's of Science in Aquaculture, Environment, and Society. Um, and I had the privilege to spend time at a number of institutions, uh, the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences, the University of Crete, the University of Nantes, uh, which are my degree universities. But I also did my thesis work at the Yellow Sea Fisheries Research Institute. Um, so sustainable aquaculture is a really big topic. Um, so I wanna focus actually on some things that are a bit controversial. So that's why I say from narratives to nuance because uh, we sometimes hear big ideas, big conclusions about what aquaculture is, the problems it has. Uh, and it's, it's actually quite a bit more complicated than that in most cases. Um, I'll actually draw your attention to the photo you see here in the background. This is a photo I took a few months ago in a place called Xiapu County in Fujian province in uh, south southeastern China. Um, and this is, a, is one of my favorite photos because if you look from left all the way in that sort of uh, left hand corner is uh, some shrimp farms. Then you see these buoys in the distance. Uh, and these are Gracilaria and kelp lines. You move over to, to, over to the blue cage, and this is uh, yellow croaker, maybe some um, green, but mostly yellow croaker. And you move over to the right, and you have more uh, shrimp farms and um, a, a razor clam farms. So this is, for me, was like, wow, I've never seen such dense and diverse aquaculture. Um, in one place. And so this is one thing we'll come back to, but you know, this is, is this the future of aquaculture? And I think that's something that's interesting for us to, to discuss. That was supposed to, 
Okay, so just uh, to talk about today, I'll talk about just really briefly aquaculture because uh, you can Google what aquaculture is and what's happening. Uh, I'd really like to get into some more complicated things like the environmental impact, putting it in context, talking about good governance um, and some of the developments related to sustainability and just leaving with some final notes. So just quickly, um, we're looking at a pretty, pretty massive production of 110 million tons, um, 30 million of which is aquatic plants. So that's quite interesting, um, especially if you're from a country like mine where you have no interaction with grown aquatic plants in your diet. Um, and so this is already an indication of a very heterogeneous experience with aquaculture. Uh, sorry for the distortion here that happened with the download. Um, but fin fish are the biggest part of that. And about 64% uh, of farmed fish is um, inland farmed fish. And of that, we're talking about around 90% of which is fin fish. So that's actually what's driving a lot of this, this fin fish dominance here is um, inland uh, aquaculture, particularly, of course, in China, uh, but also throughout Asia. Um, mollusks make up another large part, again, um, Chinese, but this is predominantly marine mollusks. So we're talking about oysters, scallops, clams, mussels, etc. Of course, crustaceans, and this we're, we're not talking just about China, we're also talking about India, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and their production of shrimp. Um, and then it's interesting because we hear this term often, so this is the first narrative I want to address. We hear this term often, aquaculture produces 50% of our seafood. And if you look at the numbers I have here, yes, we get close to 50% with China only. So for a very large majority of the world, their experience with fisheries products is not 50% aquaculture, and their country is not 50% aquaculture or more. Uh, and so it's important to take that within, with it, to appreciate that. Um, so 20, only about 30% of the rest of the world, minus China, um, fisheries production comes from aquaculture. So why do we need to talk about sustainable aquaculture? Uh, it's because there's a number of environmental impacts. I'm sure many of you, based on the audience, are aware of what these are. We have nutrient pollution. Uh, we have chemical and medicinal pollution. You know, antibiotics has become a big issue. Um, chemicals related to keeping uh, fouling organisms off cages has become an issue. Um, escapes and genetic contamination or the introduction of invasive species is a really massive issue. Um, especially in, in the developed world, we talk a lot about salmon escapes, for example. A big issue in the developing world is habitat destruction. Of course, the most infamous example of that would be the loss of mangroves to shrimp. Although some new evidence would sort of say, was it just shrimp um, that led to that or that led to the most significant part of that? So that's, that's also something to, to think about. And then of course, there's a number of social conflicts that exist in many countries. Um, for example, a notable one might be Scotland where you have the big conflict between recreational salmon uh, fishers and uh, the salmon farming industry. And um, yeah. But I also want us to think about aquaculture within a context, right? So we, we feed ourselves as people, as a society, and we do it in a number of ways. And we do it with aquaculture now increasingly, but we've been doing it historically for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years via, or sorry, tens of thousands of years, rather, for fisheries and, and agriculture. So uh, near, and this is a, we'll talk about fisheries. This is just the North Sea, and this is a, a picture from the European Environment Agency. And nearly the entire North Sea gets trawled as many as 10 times per year. Um, other parts, okay, less often, maybe once every two years. But uh, this is just bottom trawling, which is just one method of fisheries extraction, which can be highly destructive. A number of these fisheries are also marine stewardship certified or other certifications. And so, you know, in terms of the impact uh, that we're talking about, this is an entire sea in just one of them. 
uh, in aquaculture, we're usually talking about a few cages in a bay that usually have a documented uh, area of impact of less than 100 meters, more or less. Of course, when you get into the developed world, this becomes much more complicated. But if we think about the 1 million tons of salmon that are coming from Norway, you know, how comparative is it in terms of the, the amount of food we're taking for the amount of area that we're impacting? And then uh, agriculture is, is another example. Many people go to Scotland and they, they view the rolling hills uh, with sheep and it's, it's idyllic and it's a classic Scotland. Um, or even England, most of the English countryside actually looks quite similar to this. But actually the reality is that this is not at all what the, the British Isles should look like. Sheep aren't even native to the British Isles. There's only one species, I believe, of native goat. They were brought there by humans a few thousand years ago. And so basically the entire landscape that you see that you might classify as idyllic is actually an ecological tragedy. So we have to keep in mind that uh, humans have already shaped the planet um, and we're doing it, we've done it very inefficiently. And so we have to, I want us to keep these two things in mind when we're critiquing aquaculture and just making sure that we're being fair. Are we as um, critical of agriculture of these idyllic landscapes of our fisheries as we are of aquaculture. I personally would argue that typically we've been quite critical of aquaculture in a way that we're not critical of, of fisheries and agriculture in some respects. So I talked about some of these um, problems that we have with aquaculture. Recently, I did some work for the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, helping them look at, at siting and how they could improve their standards. And I went through basically all of the world's literature on siting, all of the reports from IUCN, from Marine Conservation Society, et cetera, et cetera. And I broke it down into sort of 10 key things that if you have these, the chances of having a siting related or a location related uh, aquaculture problems are very, very, very small. And so let's start at the top and just work our way through. So marine spatial planning, I think most of you would know what that is but this is basically zoning for the sea. Um, and it's important for us to do this because it helps mitigate social conflicts to begin with, but it also helps us put everything in the appropriate, in the appropriate place and make sure that we don't have negative in, uh, interactions between our, between our industries like fisheries or aquaculture or oil extraction, these kinds of things, but also make sure that we can capitalize on synergies. Um, Area-based management is sort of a new area of aquaculture management. Typically you manage a farm, but uh, increasingly we're realizing that doesn't make sense if you have four farms in one bay and the, the impacts of which are all shared. You should probably be air managing the area. Uh, and so this is a really an important aspect. We have very good models in science now to evaluate carrying capacity, which is the amount of uh, aquaculture that uh, an environment can handle. So it should be included in uh, the siting requirements for aquaculture, but I can tell you that in most of the world it is not. Uh, assimilative capacity sort of builds into carrying capacity, but it's specifically looking at what is the nutrient balance in the environment, how much additional nutrients can it take. Um, I talked about how there's, we have this idea that aquaculture can contribute nutrient pollution, and this is true. Although uh, actually there are very few documented cases outside of China where you can really say aquaculture is the culprit for, for eutrophication. Typically, for example, in the Mediterranean, largest sources of uh, nutrient pollution are other human activities, agriculture, um, water treatment, runoff, et cetera. So, you know, some, it's easy to pick on aquaculture because it's obvious to see and you can calculate easily uh, the per fish nitrogen uh, pollution, but when put in context, it can actually be very small in many, many uh, environments, which is why it's important to understand assimilative capacity. Social legitimacy is really important um, because, you know, we have aquaculture companies in the past have just sort of entered an area, started farming there, uh, made economic promises and sort of maybe disrupted the, the, the social ecosystem, if you will. And so 
aquaculture really needs to be done with the planning of local people in mind, making sure that the benefit, the economic benefits uh, are going to the locals and that the, any environmental problems that are being caused are not being, you know, burdened upon uh, local communities. Uh, of course, we should be doing environmental impact and risk assessments. I can tell you again, much of the, most of the world is not doing this. But interestingly, even in countries, for example, like Canada, which has a really good environmental impact assessment uh, protocol, uh, number seven I have here is mitigation follow through. So a lot of the, the, a lot of activities, whether it's aquaculture or a hotel or whatever, promise mitigation in order to, you know, meet all of the environmental burden. And then there's actually very little infrastructure off, off, often to, to make sure that there's follow through here. So if there's no follow through, then there's, and there's no mitigation, then probably your farm or whatever activity shouldn't be there to begin with. Uh, eight, nine, and 10 are pretty obvious. We should be, you know, we need to have strict and comprehensive protection of biodiversity, species, habitats, sensitive ecosystems, and more salient than ever is carbon sinks to make sure that you know, we're not increasing our carbon footprint any more than we, we already are. Uh, so I wanna get into some of the challenges that exist, some of the nuances and some of the narratives that uh, we have. So here I have a slide from a really good paper called Rethinking Farm Fish Consumption in the Global South. And this is really interesting. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the, the second bar of each of these uh, country graphs because this is the aquaculture one. The blue is the amount of their aquaculture production that's exported and the orange is the one that's, that stays domestically. So you can see in all of these countries, which are countries that are um, middle income or developing, uh, most of actually their aquaculture production except for Vietnam and Thailand, stays within the country. So we often have this narrative sometimes that, oh, aquaculture is just for the global elite or, you know, because we, we associate that with salmon and shrimp and pangasius and these higher value products. But in reality, actually, there's a sort of missing middle. A lar the largest amount of aquaculture production stays domestically and contributes greatly to food security and to rising incomes. For example, in China, farmers told me that in the agricultural realm, aquaculture is, a, is still a very relied upon method of climbing the social ladder because it's the highest paying uh, type of, uh, of agriculture. Um, and so some other sources here you can check out is, uh, is Aquaculture Pro Poor, another paper that demonstrates that uh, small scale fish farmers, middle scale fish farmers uh, can really benefit um, from in increased access to nutrition and it can be benefit the wider local economy. Um, so that's, that's one, one narrative that I wanted to talk about. And the other one is about fish feed, which I'll spend a bit of time talking about later as well. But this one is, is a pernicious one, I would call it because so often we have this idea that aquaculture is exploiting our global capture fisheries, that it's not an additive source of protein. Uh, if you look at this graph though, especially from 1990 to 2012, you'll see that the non-food use fish, uh, fish consumption has actually declined. And you'll see that the capture for, but you'll see just how dramatically aquaculture for human consumption has actually increased. So in terms of is it limiting um, aquaculture production, is fish feed, act, uh, fish meal, fish oil access limiting? No, definitely not. And this has been a, an actually an expanded growth in fed species, right? So the rate of increase in unfed species is decreasing, though they're still increasing whereas the rate of increase in fed species is increasing. So not only throughout this entire time has the amount of aqua feed production increased, the amount of fed species has also increased, and yet still we look and we see non-food use fish production has barely budged really since the 1970s. Uh, so the narrative that aquaculture is contributing to the destruction of wild capture fisheries in a large sense is false. Of course, I can tell from personal experience that in some cases it definitely is a factor. For example, visiting uh, yellow croaker farms in China, 
I watched them take trash fish right off of a boat that was probably illegal uh, to feed to feed the farm uh, their fish, and it was really an, just an ungodly amount. Um, but what this what this tells us is that as fish feeds become available, farmers are quite apt to adopt them. And farmers told me on that farm, and it was the only species actually that they weren't using a, a, a aqua feed for, was because they didn't have a satisfactory aqua feed. So this is the importance of research, the importance of uh, understanding farmer challenges, and satisfying those can really decrease things like illegal trash fish fisheries uh, in the developing world. Uh, so now I want to talk about uh, developments in sustainability. I don't know if there's any questions, but I'm happy to, if I can figure out how to open that. I'm not really sure about that. It's all good. Okay. Um, so sort of some developments in sustainability. So we have RAS systems, which totally mit mit there's the impacts, disease and contamination. Uh, we have a lot of problems related to escapes, which is usually related to weather. Um, all of these things can be mitigated by farming on land. But, of course, typically you need coastal land, which is not readily, always readily available. So that requires space. Um, also, a lot of times freshwater usage, though now RAS systems are getting increasingly efficient. Right here in the picture you see of the, the blue house, they call it, from a company called Pacific Sapphire that grows uh, RAS salmon in Denmark and Miami. They have a something like 99% uh, water recycling rate. So these systems are getting enormously efficient. And I definitely see them as important in the future of aquaculture. We have to in mind that they require a lot of a lot of technical specification. Uh, and in order for them to compete with the, the open environment, uh, you need a, a pretty big scale. So, for example, I think their farm in Miami is going to be the world's largest once uh, But definitely, developments in RAS are really important. In countries that, uh, do a lot of pond farming and already are using a lot of a lot of inland territory. They can be a lot more efficient uh, uses of water. It's with a lot of disease problems. And disease is not something I'm going to talk about today because it's not something I have uh, direct experience with, but this is definitely one of the most pressing challenges. Um, so offshore aquaculture. Here we have uh, open blue cobia in the picture, which is one of, was one of the first really offshore uh, aquaculture operations. And um, this is great. Salmon farmers are also looking towards offshore as they're sort of saving grace from sea lice and problems with expanding in, in a limited coastal area. But um, of course, these are really high cost. So for example, open blue cobia is not for the average person. Um, it's a pretty, pretty niche product, goes to high-end restaurants and things in the, in the developed world. So we have to keep that in mind that these solute, how accessible are these solutions going to be in terms of real food security? Um, that's to be seen. You know, if you have such as Ocean Farm One, which is being built by, um, I don't know who's building that, but you know, you can stock a million salmon. Okay, you can reach a scale where it's still the same cost as uh, farming in the coastline. But otherwise, you also, you know, it can be difficult to access. It's difficult to assess the impacts. You have an increased carbon footprint because you're going way out. Um, you need a lot, of, uh, a lot of infrastructure like that. And you need technical specifications and scale again, uh, which can, can be problematic. But of course, in terms of our high value finfish species, I think offshore is really, really promising. Um, Plant-based feeds. So, of course, reducing dependency on wild fisheries, um, possibly improving carbon footprint, but uh, it's not so simple. So we, we talk about reducing um, fin, we talk about reducing fish meal, fish feed reliance, um, but I, I think that this has a, a limit in some respects 
because you, you could just be subsidizing impacts in the ocean onto impacts uh, on land. So for example, recently everyone's aware of the Amazon fires and um, one company, I think it was Scredding who makes food, uh, quickly uh, announced that they were suspending purchases from Brazilian soybean farmers, which Brazil produces like 30% of the global soy meal um, uh, supply. So, you know, the, the transition from, from, fin fit, from fish meal and fish oil could be leading to deforestation, for example. Uh, this is why it's important to have certification of feed and things like that, which are which cover a large amount of aquaculture's uh, of use. But uh, still, we need to keep in mind that land and water, fresh water, are really valuable resources increasingly. And uh, it may not be better to, to move the impacts onto land when we can be using fin fish that people don't typically eat, like anchovy which yes it's suitable for human nutrition but if people wanted to eat it they would pay a better price for it in most cases and so forcing people to a market preference is not really a, a wise uh, strategy um and then also the other thing to note is that 25 percent of global fin, uh, fish meal and fish oil now comes from processing wastes so actually if we're talking about circular economy uh, we're getting the health benefits from those, those fish parts that, you know, we would never otherwise be using. And so just getting, digging into land alternatives again, there's actually some worry that it's decreasing the health of uh, Atlantic farmed salmon in particular, but also relevant to sea bream, sea bass, other high valued fin fish. You can see in this graph here that uh, in 2006, you can see the difference in the, the flesh omega-3 uh, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is why doctors recommend eating, you know, two meals of fish per week um, and how much it's decreased, still better than wild. Um, but actually the more the balance shifts from omega-6 fatty acids, which is what's found in the, the plant alternatives, and it can actually make it more difficult for humans to uptake omega-3s. So it could be that if we make our fish, our, our fin fish too um, vegetarian, if you will, not only could it be a welfare issue for the fish, but it could also actually make the omega-3 impact of fish less suitable for human consumption. So these are things that we have to keep in mind. But still, we want to put this in context, and this was a really interesting study from uh, one of my favorite authors, Hallie Froelich at uh, University of California, um, University of California, I'm not sure where. Uh, but um, this looks at different scenarios. You can see the current. Um, you can see business as usual going to 2050. You can see if it's, if they, and this, what she's talking about here, is the feed crops required to grow all of these various uh, meat products, beef, dairy, pig, sheep. And if we switch the growth from meat to fin fish, the first one is mixed, so both freshwater and marine, or we switch it to just marine, so basically no growth in, or very limited growth in meat production, and we switch that growth to fish production, how much uh, feed would be required. And you can see that it's quite a substantial significant difference here um, between the substitution and continuing on as the, the business as usual. And that's just because even if we keep using feed crops, which like I said, have some sustainability challenges of their own, it's still better to be using feed crops on fin fish than it is to be using it on land animals, which are just really inefficient when you compare them to, to fish. Um, another vanguard of sustainable aquaculture is this idea of carbon sequestration and this regener regenerative aquaculture. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Bren Smith and 3D, 3D aquaculture, Green Wave. Uh, it's a kind of integrated mariculture. Um, the good news, and this is a study from just last month, um, 
seaweed farming does indeed contribute to organic carbon sequestration. That's because the carbon is very refractory, which means it's not easily used when the, the, car, when the kelp break apart, for example. Unfortunately, it's not the same for shellfish. Um, that's been, it, I mean, it's just not how ocean chemistry works. When you, when you create the shell, you also have a venting of carbon dioxide. So it's a, if anything, burying the shell maybe prevents the remineralization of CO2, but if you have carbon sequestration from shellfish, it would be related to them eating algae and then returning that algae to the benthos as feces. Um, and in some systems that actually might be a net source of carbon and others it might be a sink. So if someone is telling you carbon sequestration via shellfish, no, not, not in, it depends very much specifically on the environment. Uh, certification. Can we certify sustainable aquaculture? Is that gonna solve our problems? Um, this is a really great paper called Certify Sustainable Aquaculture. And basically, if you look at species specific standards, 60% of the world's aquaculture is currently non-certifiable. Um, and then another 30% could be, but there's not a demand to make it certifiable. Um, and so this is really problematic because these certifications basically hit a wall when it comes to the main source of both aquaculture pollution and also the main source of aquaculture production, which is in the, the global south, in uh, middle to small to middle scale farms, uh, across China, across Asia, now in Africa, South America. So these farms are beyond the scope of uh, certifications, which really depend on wealthy consumers in developing countries wanting sustainable standards and basically forcing our uh, sustainability criteria into developing countries. So <clears throat> you need to develop a local demand, current market demand, in order to be able to, to get those, those certifications uh, to, or get those sustainability benefits to reach other parts of the world. So certification, eh, it's, not, it's not a, definitely not a catch-all. Another potential solution is integrated mariculture. So this is what I did my, my thesis on, so I'll spend a bit of time talking about this. In the right, you have uh, IMTA, and uh, this is classic you know, salmon farm, and then nearby you have mussels, which are eating the, the organic particulate matter. Then you have seaweeds, which take care of the, the inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus that are released. Um, this is a very technical, technocratic perspective of integrated mariculture, one that has been trying to be developed in the West for about 30 years to basically no avail. There's some experimental ones in Canada, Australia, <laughs> and other parts of the world. Um, it has its benefits, of course, improved efficiencies, better production per area, economic benefits of that, risk reduction, you mitigate the environmental impact substantially, so you could potentially increase your intensity. But these are really complex systems. They're often difficult in the developed countries for the regulatory regimes to handle. Um, freshwater usage, um, in some cases can be a problem if we're talking about inland um, integrated mariculture, uh, integrated aquaculture. Um, they require higher investment and their success really depends on location. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about China because basically all of the aquaculture that happens in China is in some way integrated or the vast majority of it. And uh, I say mariculture here, but this, that's my specialty and this was taken from uh, my presentation, but this applies to aquaculture generally. So we have many, many kinds. You'll see in the left is trophic integration. So this is basically what the West and developed countries have hyper-focused on, is can we put these three species together perfectly, balance everything. Uh, but the, the Chinese in particular have a much more uh, rational and varied approach. And they recognize that integrated mariculture can have a lot of other benefits, such as maximizing space, maximizing time, uh, maximizing the functions within the environment, uh, preventing diseases. Um, you can even have systems integration where you have, for example, um, partition systems, you might have uh, ranching, you might have aquatourism. So we really could be making aquaculture a lot more efficient uh, 
throughout the world if we started taking some lessons uh, from the Chinese development, I believe. But, of course, everything we need to have evidence for. And um, so here I'll just go through some of the, the benefits that are proposed from integrated mariculture, particularly in the West, and talk about whether or not they're actually true. So yes, algae do bioremediate nutrients, this is for sure. Can shellfish take up aquaculture um, wastes? Uh, this is very much dependent upon the environment, basically, on the species. And also, if you're talking about, for example, oysters or mussels, it depends on what kind of algae are around because they're highly selective. So if they have a better food source, they might not help you with your fish farm. Um, so really, the evidence for that is actually pretty weak. Um, do they provide additional ecosystem services? This is really an exciting um, place to go with aquaculture because we might be able to add economic value to sustainable aquaculture, to aquaculture that is extractive, if we can find a way to monetize and internalize the, the economic benefit of uh, you know, respecting the environment and, and creating extractive services. Is it more efficient and productive? Well, that depends. Once you get much more technically specific, such as uh, the salmon industry, the idea of trying to also then farm mussels is absurd. That's not, it, it wouldn't work within globally integrated supply chains and highly specific procedures and production processes. But in places like China, the Philippines, Indonesia, where you still have very low, low skill, low technology aquaculture with very versatile productive me production methods, you could very easily increase the product uh, productivity. Um, profitability, extraordinarily weak evidence for this actually. And so we really need to be more interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary in our evaluation of aquaculture, how beneficial is sustainable um, aquaculture to the producer, because if we can't give them an economic benefit, it's very unlikely that they're going to go through with it. A good example might be seaweed farming in uh, the US. Okay, seaweed is great, it's healthy, but nobody really eats seaweed besides, you know, nori and your sushi. It's not a common diet part of the, the American diet, for example. So, okay, we can encourage people to farm seaweed all they want, but if they can't turn a profit on it because there's no way to sell it, this becomes problematic. Um, and then others such as, like I said, CO2 reductions. Uh, well, we'll see. So the final thing I want to talk about is where is innovation happening in aquaculture? So we're going to change to startups. A few months ago, I was curious to see what are the main startups in aquaculture working on. Um, and so you can see from this little slightly confusing uh, figure, uh, there are a lot working on fish meal alternatives, particularly insect protein, which I think is a really exciting one, fits well into the circular economy model, uses land waste products, creates a high protein alternative. Um, I think it's, it's a very promising thing. And obviously that's why we have so many startups, many of which are valued already or have received more than a hundred million uh, euros worth of funding. Other proteins being considered. And so these, these are really important because they're not just fish meal alternatives, but they're also land-based plant meal alternatives. And as we discussed, there's a lot of conflicts, uh, problems with those as well. Uh, traceability is really important. So we have some, some startups working on that. Um, there's some startups that are working on what can you do with the leftovers, like shell bound and creating, uh, creating a polymer or glue out of shell, shell waste. Um, there's a lot going on in precision farming, and I'm going to talk about these ones in particular in the next slide. Um, but the benefits of those, uh, are they going to, where, like I said, this missing middle where most of the, the aquaculture happens, where most of the environmental impacts happen? Um, and then, of course, we have some health and reproduction stuff, but that's typical of uh, any agricultural sector. So just to, to, to leave off, actually, um, uh, the last thing is about what are some of these startups, particularly the high tech ones working on. And so I have here a chart, you can see shrimp at the top, high value fin fish at the bottom, which is like salmon, sea green, sea bass, uh, cobia, these kinds of fish. 
and then non-specific in the middle. And you can see that a huge number of these startups are working on shrimp and they're working on high value thin fish. And they're working only in high income economies or Indonesia and India. And then there's a few that are a bit non-specific. And this is really interesting and possibly concerning because for example, fin fish makes up less than 5% of the entire global production of aquaculture. So that means that we have an, an enormous amount of resources, an enormous amount of money is going towards investment in technology that will never be accessible or not for in the foreseeable future be accessible to a small scale farmer in China, for example. Um, shrimp is a bit more promising, but at the same time, shrimp is one of those things where, yes, it is dedicated towards um, the sort of global elite wealthier um, even within uh, the developed countries, it developing countries, it typically goes to the cities. So the benefit in terms of uh, food production and uh, food security is kind of hard to, hard to see when you're focusing exclusively on, on shrimp production. So really, this is something that's concerning. And hopefully, uh, these startups are, are capitalizing on, on really high value markets for, for scale, for investment, and have plans to expand their, their, their technology towards the middle, the missing middle, and the, the sort of small scale farmer or middle scale farmer throughout the rest of the world. Because that's really where we're gonna see a reduction in the impacts, environmental impacts of aquaculture, and also an increase in food, food security, food stability from aquaculture. So just concluding with some key points, um, aquaculture is an increasingly sustainable source of proteins and nutrients. It's pretty much only getting better and that's something that's, that's quite promising. Um, and it, it is essential to feeding the world. I think that we cannot ignore that. It's still the fastest growing uh, food production sector. And you know we are using such a tiny, tiny fraction of most of the world's, uh, most of the world's coastlines and, and our ocean to, to farm while we are you know, use, using them and exhausting our fisheries resources. So that's something that we, we need to think about more carefully. Um, zoning and marine spatial planning. We have most of the solutions to make aquaculture pretty sustainable. It's really about good governance and it's really about making that governance system accessible within developing countries. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that intensive means intensive. So even if you're farming grouper, which obviously can have pretty in intensive uh, impacts on the environment, so can kelp. I mean, having been to one of the world's largest kelp producing bay, uh, the entire ecosystem is entirely mediated by the kelp production from the very beginning of, of phytoplankton production. So, you know, kelp is extractive. Yes, it sequesters carbon, but it can also completely reshape an environment and an ecosystem. And that's something that we need to appreciate. And then ultimately, markets, 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 it's the economy, stupid. Uh, we need to develop a market for sustainable aquaculture within developing countries, which will then, which is sort of happening within China, for example, and it's leading towards uh, new labeling, the buildup of, of ASC and the adoption of that in, in some Chinese uh, supermarkets, for example. Uh, and you can see that throughout the rest of, of the developing world in the middle income countries. But then also I say it's essential for the developed world because we need to develop a more sustainable taste for seafood like herbivorous fish, like shellfish, like seaweed um, and, and our marine vegetables, if you will. Because if we can do that, then we can really incentivize farmers to start to start using more uh, lower trophic level uh, species. So that's just a really big overview of some issues that I find interesting with sustainable aquaculture. Um, and there's many things there I think we can have a bit of a discussion about. Fantastic. Thank you, Ron. That was extremely informative. So now is a perfect opportunity to dive into any questions anyone may have. Um, feel free to un unmute yourself and ask it outright, or if you'd prefer to write it in the text box, that works as well. I just want to share that I'm really happy with this 
presentation you did. When I was studying aquaculture in my mar marine biology studies, I was, I thought that the only way that could work out was an integrated system, a bit like permaculture in, on land, because we need like um, smaller systems working really well, um, but many of them, like it's the same, not like on land, not such big scale massive production because it's very it's very hard to control and to monetize the environment issues that we always have because uh, and, and i was really happy that you did your project on that and you explained really well many points that i had some questions especially for me with the feeding question uh, to feed the animals in aquaculture because I know they use soya many times and I heard a lot in Portugal about diseases and many problems with this kind of food they have they give to fish so it was really nice that you talked about that and the omega-3 problem we have in absorption I didn't know that it was really interesting so, yeah. Many thanks for your comments, uh, Lanya. Um, yeah, I think that it's a really interesting aspect about the scale. And for example, like, I, like I've said several times, it's the missing middle, as we call it, because they don't get discussed so much. We hear a lot about small scale farmers and, uh, and uh, major scale farmers, uh, but there's also a large number of people who make a bit of their income, their food security, um, Bangladesh being a really notable example, uh, where world fish is based, for example, um, where they're producing aquaculture, fin fish, um, in sort of medium scale operations. And this is really what's uh, creating a lot of the, the aquaculture production. In China, it's very similar. It's very rare, actually, to see massively integrated companies in aquaculture. Um, there are a few and increasingly there are more and this happens as you get more environmental regulation actually environmental regulation favors big companies because it's easier to meet the cost of, uh, of regulation so this is something we have to consider but uh, there's some companies for example aqua connect i really encourage you to look at their work that are figuring out how can they how can they disseminate knowledge uh, there's another one called efficiency i think how can you disseminate knowledge about Good productive, uh, good production practices because farmers don't like to lose money, so they don't like when their fish die. And typically, when their fish are dying, it's a, probably a bad environmental conflict as a co consequence as well. So um, it's you know, farmers can be motivated to be environmentally responsible, and in a lot of cases, the the sustainability piece here is that they just don't have the knowledge, they don't have the resources. And so outreach and extension work is extremely critical to making these middle, middle producers much more sustainable than they currently are, but also much more efficient, uh, which is important for food production. I just want to address some comments. We have Ian asked, how would one go about trying to quantify the environmental impact of aquaculture? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by quantify. Um, uh, there's many, many metrics. I can send you a paper that talks about something like 60 indicators of what uh, is sustainable aquaculture. And a lot of those indicators you'll find within standards like the Aquaculture Stewardship Council's standard, for example. Uh, and this is things as much, you know, it can be down to the details of what is your sulfide concentration in your benthos to, you know, how rigorous was your environmental impact assessment, um, these kinds of things. But um, escapes has been a huge problem. Chile is a notably painful example of salmon escapes and how they've sort of uh, established themselves in Chile where no salmonids are native to. Uh, it's also a tragic example of when you put um, too many farms in one place and you get a huge breakout that has killed, that killed in 2010, seven to 10, tens of millions of fish. So, but again, those problems would have been mitigated, well, not the escapes part, but that's what you get for putting an invasive species where it doesn't belong. But um, 
in terms of the, the disease, a lot of those problems would have been mitigated by proper siting. So a lot of it goes back to, you know, what, what was done to make sure that this farm was in a good position to begin with. Another example is tassel in um, Macquarie Bay in uh, Australia, Tasmania, Australia. And again, you have a closed bay, very deep, very poor circulation and overturning, but the, the, basically you had a system of regulatory capture where the promoter of aquaculture was also the regulator of aquaculture. And they just let as many farms get sited there as possible into the, until the fact actually um, one of the salmon farmers sued the government for allowing more salmon producers there. So, you know, we have to, it, a lot of times it could just be bad governance. It's not that aquaculture is, are, are primarily bad actors. Um, and so that's why siting is just so, so critical. Uh, algae blooms. This is really tough. Actually, there is very little evidence that links aquaculture directly to harmful algal blooms, except for in very enclosed bays, which, for example, in Greece and Turkey is illegal. You can't put farms in enclosed shallow bays anymore or lagoons. And in China, but that's because they're reaching a scale, you know, where you have tens of thousands of tons in one or hundreds of thousands of tons in one bay. So, of course, you can get algal blooms. What is more clear is that the, the releases from salmon, from, from uh, fish farms, can generate, um, can preference certain species of algae that may then lead to a harmful algal bloom, especially if the system is already eutrophied by other human instances. So if you have a, you know, poorly treated water and you also have some, uh, some kind of fish farm nearby, you could have this situation where near the fish farm, they're selecting their, their nutrient uh, profile into the water is sort of preferencing a kind of algae that's more harmful. Then it takes advantage of the nutrient rich conditions and you could get a harmful algae bloom. Um, so this, these are really, really specific uh, instances, but generally there is a very tenuous link between algae blooms and aquaculture, only in areas, like I said, where you have very poor siting and control. Um, Jen has asked about resources demonstrating a causal impact of aquaculture production on food security. Uh, if you go back to my slide, there's a few different sources there that talk about how aquaculture undoubtedly contributes to, to increased food supply, increased food security in, in many places. It's not always so clear cut, but typically, yes. Uh, it does this from a number of points of, of view. One is it can stabilize prices, uh, for example, of, white, of similar product, among similar products. And it can also lead to falls in prices. Uh, of all fisheries products, actually, sort of market competition undermining there. And then it can also, um, it can also, the sale of fish to, to cities, for example, income in rural economies, for example, which then allows them greater access to food, so increased food security. Um, offshore aquaculture. I, I talked about it. Um, like I said, I think for the time being, the next decade, it's only going to be really promising for high value fin fish, which, like I said, is for a very, very select few if you're talking about the world. <laughs> um, it's not going to be, you know, producing aquaculture that's accessible to everyone, in my opinion. Um, China is a notable difference because of the way their aquaculture is structured. So it's a lot of the, the comments I make sometimes say it's difficult to apply them to, to China in some ways. This is being one of them because of government subsidies, because of there's no taxes on aquaculture, because of the close relationship with science, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes. Someone asked, can we restock the ocean? So there was actually a really good review article, I can find it and send it to you, Christy, um, that looked at basically every restocking program around the world and found very little evidence that most of them have contributed to what you might consider restocking. What it typically does, and not always, for example, Japan does, I'm 
pretty much all of Japan's wild coastal fisheries are related to restocking. But what it does do is at least allows a fishery to continue. So pink salmon in Alaska is a good example. They stock tens of millions of smalt and uh, they harvest millions of salmon at the end. And it keeps the industry afloat, basically. In Japan, you have the same thing with urchins and some sea cucumbers. Um, what is interesting, though, is that China is embarking on a, a massive scale ranching program, which we just don't have time to dig into, but I think is just so interesting. And they, they, have, they have designated areas of a minimum 50,000 square kilometers to be ranching zones, where basically they have put in hundreds to thousands of artificial reefs, cement blocks. I would argue they, they haven't really done the science to justify it, but anyways, they do it. Um, and they're also stocking with all kinds of, uh, of organisms, be it sea cucumbers, be it um, uh, scallops, uh, oysters, clams, etc. And then they're also stocking finfish, which they don't actually harvest intensively. So they are doing a sort of quasi environmental engineering uh, thing, which could contribute to increasing uh, biomass abundances. But of course, this depends on how intensively you're fishing what you're stocking. So most times though, the, it's just not worth it to use aquaculture to restock because unless there's a fishery for that species. Other questions? Well, great. Thank you all for your engagement throughout this hour plus long uh, webinar and Ron that was fantastic very comprehensive and and uh, compelling in terms of uh, Brandon oh, I think we lost him I am back my internet is uh, been a little unstable. But before I get kicked off again, thank you all for joining. And we will see you on the next episode of Ocean Learning Labs. Uh, and we will make this available to you over the internet via recording. Feel free really to... Thank everyone who came. I really appreciate you taking the time to hear me rant about my favorite topic. Thanks for ranting and thank you all for coming. Have a great rest of the day and uh, we will see you next time. And I'm uh, happy to chat with anybody at any time about other aquaculture issues if you want to, uh, yeah, you have any other questions. And if you need any resources, I have uh, you know something like a thousand aquaculture papers on my computer so I can help. <laughs> awesome. Great. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks, Christy, for coming. <laughs>